Hi everyone, thank you very much for your interest today. Um, always good to hear beforehand um, people who are familiar and people who are not so familiar with Murray International, so I will um, attempt to keep it relevant for both. Um, on to the next slide, please. Um, an introduction to the trust. So this is a, a large global equity income trust, a traditional trust. Um, the size is about 1.8 billion in sterling in terms of gross assets. Uh, predominantly invested in global equities, we make full use of that global remit, which we will come on to. And one thing to highlight is that there is a focus on capital preservation within the trust. We tend to do better um, when markets are, are not at all time highs and everything is looking rosy. So it can be quite an interesting investment from that perspective. The track record of the dividend yield is something to highlight. So we have currently about 4.7% uh, in terms of a dividend yield, which has grown consecutively over the past 19 years. It is differentiated from lots of other global equity products out there and index trackers as well. For example, there is no exposure to the Magnificent Seven. The trust is currently trading at a discount, as many investment trusts are. So from that perspective, um, some people do consider this to be um, quite a good opportunity. Um, on to the next slide, please. And we will just start with a reminder about what the objective is. And we speak about this in every single meeting that we speak to shareholders about. Um, so the next slide will just really emphasise what we're trying to do here with this trust. Um, the investment objective is to deliver an above average dividend yield. And in the context of our peers, um, as decided by the EIC, um, that has been achieved by delivering a dividend yield of between 4 and 5% consistently over time. We want to both grow that dividend and grow the capital ahead of inflation over time. And we want to do it by having ideally a covered dividend. So we want to pay income out of income that is generated from our underlying holdings. So again, when I mention a traditional income product, that's what I mean. Um, we don't pay income out of capital, we pay it out of income. Um, in terms of the track record on each of these things, um, it's pretty decent. So you can see that above average dividend yield going back consistently over time. And we have managed to achieve the dividend growth ahead of inflation and the capital ahead of inflation most of the time. It has been tricky as inflation has been higher um, over the past three years or so, uh, but over, over time, that's something that we have managed to achieve more often than not. One thing to highlight here is that that long-term total NEV return of 10% annualised in sterling is a little bit ahead of you know, any general global equity index, but how it has been achieved is very different over time. So roughly half coming from income, half coming from capital over that time. And you will find, given the more defensive nature of our portfolio overall, uh, we, we can perform very, very differently from a global index, which again, I think is a valuable thing to have. Um, and on to the next slide, please. Um, the next section really talks about over the last six months, what we've been up to, what we've been doing, what has been successful and what has not been as successful. Um, these figures, uh, we update twice a year. So we go out and speak to shareholders typically after the full year results are announced, roughly in February of each year. And then after the half year results, which are usually about August time. Um, and this is where we just have a look back over that time period and see what's been going on. It's relatively easy for us to do this because we don't have hundreds and hundreds of stocks here. We have uh, roughly 50 equity holdings in Murray International. And um, so it's very easy to identify what's been going on. We always have a high degree of dispersion in terms of how the underlying holdings are performing. And that's something that we're happy about because we never want all of our stocks to do well at the same time because they will all do badly at the same time. So 
you will always see a range of performance and the underlying investments, both from a country perspective and also uh, when we go on to look at the sector performance. Uh, but just over the last six months or so, what has worked has been some of our Asian equities, and uh, particularly some of the technology companies within that category. So um, tech isn't something that's necessarily associated with an income portfolio, but um, we can and we do manage to find exposure there. And we do manage to find exposure there in lots of different regions, not just the US. Um, so within Asian equities, one stock, for example, Honhai Precision, uh, it doubled actually year to date. Um, another name, TSMC, which is probably more familiar to people, Taiwan Semiconductor, another very strong performer over this time period. So that was part of the reason why we had very strong performance from Asia. Um, North American equities, another strong category. Um, for the trust, again, some technology exposure in there performing pretty well. Um, at the opposite end, you will see we do have an allocation to Latin American equities. And I should highlight that all of these positions, all of these weights are a byproduct of where we're finding stocks that we like. Um, so it's all driven by stock picking with a common sense overlay um, to make sure the trust is always well diversified. And within the Latin American equities, what we have seen there is some of the more cyclical areas of the market and our holdings have been a bit weaker. Now, these have been very strong performers up to this point. So we're not surprised that they have come off. They've been a bit weaker this year. Um, over the page, please, you can see that we do also have a lot of dispersion when it comes to stocks breaking it down by sector. Um, so technology has been a very strong market category. Actually, our stock picking has been even better than you know, the MSCI All Country World, for example, despite not having any of the MAG7. So because we have things like Honhai, TSMC, Broadcom in the US, for example, um, and they have all performed very strongly, that's what's behind this 40% return in sterling from our technology names within the trust. Um, and one question we're often asked is, you know, is there not a place to have an NVIDIA or a Microsoft or an Alphabet or an Amazon, these types of names in Murray International? And the answer is no, not at this point, because going back to what we're trying to achieve and um, that income and that capital growth, and um, we need each and every one of our holdings to contribute to the income story. And these stocks at the minute just aren't suitable. Um, but it's not to say that we can't get exposure to um, really quite significant, exciting areas of the market like AI and um, through other technology holdings like TSMC, like Honhai, like Broadcom, for example. Um, other categories such as industrials also performing pretty well. Um, stocks such like Atlas Copco is a Swedish industrial company we own performing very well. Uh, we have names that you probably wouldn't have heard of. Grupo Asur, for example, is a Mexican airport operator which falls within industrials which had a very strong start to the year and then as I mentioned previously in some areas of the market such as basic materials consumer discretionary and um, not performing so well but again if you had looked at this slide two years ago it would have been exactly the opposite in terms of what was working and what had been a bit weaker and um, on to the next slide please um, this really just highlights the fact that some stocks have been weaker and some stocks have been stronger um, over that time period. Commodity stocks in general have been weak. And one thing to highlight is looking at Valley and BHP and SQM, which is a Chilean mining company. Uh, we're mindful of the weights in some of these more cyclical, more volatile names. So we have 4% in total across these names, these weaker names. And even although the capital side has been weaker, the dividends, the income that they are providing means that we still think that these are valid holdings. And as I say, they're cyclical. They will come back again at some point. Over the page again, this is the, the good news story, the tech names. They have been phenomenal performers, some of these companies, to the extent that we have taken quite a bit of money off of these names. So in Murray International, we have a minimum of 1% and a maximum of 5% in any one stock. And a few of these names, including TSMC and Broadcom, 
have consistently been bumping against that 5% maximum limit this year. Um, so we have been trimming these names really quite aggressively to make sure that we abide by that rule. Not complaining about the performance, but it has meant some top slicing. Um, and then on to the next slide, please. Um, one question we're often asked by investors is, what we do, if anything, with currency? So this is a truly global trust. It has quite a small position in the UK, presently about 5% of assets. So therefore, you have an awful lot of moving parts when it comes to assessing what the currencies are doing. And we do just accept that sometimes this can work in your favour and sometimes it can work against you on the currency side. And um, sterling strength in the first six months of this year has been a negative, um, but it's actually continued to be so um, since the end of the first half. Um, things like the Brazilian Riai, the Mexican Peso um, have been really quite um, weak against sterling. Now we have quite small exposures to these currencies that look the most dramatic. So for example, we have 3% currently in Brazil, 5% in Mexico. The currencies which we have higher exposures to, like the euro and the US dollar, haven't been nearly as volatile or as, as weak against sterling, but um, it is something to be mindful of. Sometimes this um, will have an impact on whether we have a covered dividend any one year or not. And one thing to mention on this is that we do have very healthy reserves at Murray International. So as much as we would love to have a covered dividend every single year without fail, there are sometimes years where, you know, things like this come along, a currency move or COVID was um, a very strong example of that, that we don't manage to achieve the income that we need to pay out the dividend. And that's where we can and we do sometimes dip into reserves. And so being such an old and well-established trust, um, Murray International has been around since 1907. Uh, we have, over that very long time period, managed to build up um, a reserve base of £73 million, which is roughly one year's worth of dividend payments to our shareholders. So um, as and when we do have to dip into that for a variety of reasons, um, it's there for that purpose. Um, moving on to the next section, please. Um, you can see um, the net earnings per share and the dividends per share for Murray International over time. And this highlights that point about being able to smooth out the dividend payments because of the reserves that we have. So um, pleasing to see that even though we, we did have a dip in 2020 and 2021 in terms of earnings per share, the dividend we were still able to increase over that time. And in the, the two years after that, 2022 and 2023, we still managed to pay out a growing dividend, but also replenished those reserves somewhat. So um, it's a benefit of being so global, so diverse as well, that we do have um, that ability and um, to not be hit maybe as hard as you would have expected, even in something like COVID that was so dramatic, because not everywhere was impacted to the same extent in terms of companies being able and willing to pay dividends. So that track record, that kind of solid, steady dividend growth is something um, that I think is very valuable for our shareholders as well. Um, on to the next section, please. Um, and this is where we can look at changes to the trust. So it's a buy and hold approach. And um, we have companies in Murray International that we've held for 20 years, believe it or not. And we do change the weighting. Um, and those names, it's not necessarily that the weighting is the same and static. Um, but in terms of changes, it's got to be driven by the stocks. And you can see that we have been doing a bit more selling than buying in the first half of this year, partly because we raised some money to pay back some debt. Um, so we do have some gearing in Murray International, not a huge amount. We currently have about 6% gearing as a percentage of our gross assets. Um, and we paid back some debt that was up for renewal because whereas we were paying um, about 2% on that debt, the quotes were becoming more like 6% to renew it. So as much as it can be useful at times to have gearing, we only have it if it makes sense, if we think we can, without too much trouble, 
um, earn um, quite a, a decent return on that borrowing. And when the question is not an obvious yes, um, it's very nice actually to be able to say thanks, but no thanks, we'll pay it back. So we did that with 30 million of our debt in May of this year. And that leaves us with 110 million of debt, half of which is up for renewal in 2031 and the other half in 2037. And we're paying um, a weighted average of 2.57% on that debt. It's based in sterling also. Um, so that's quite a nice position to be in. So more sales than buys, partly for that reason. Uh, we sold um, four stocks in total, which leaves us at the moment with 47 equity holdings. And we sold them for various reasons. So Roche is a company we had held for a long, long time. It's a pharma company, a, a Swiss company. That's fine. It wasn't this company um, was a disaster or it was, you know, something that we were really desperate to get out of. But it's a stock that was kind of OK. We have plenty of options in healthcare. We do have quite a high exposure there. Um, and Roche is a company that's no longer, I think, um, as high quality as it once was. It used to be um, the cancer expert, the oncology expert in the world, and it's no longer got that title, um, as lots of other companies have actually stepped up and um, really diversified and came up with brand new ways to treat the disease. So um, it doesn't quite have the same caliber as before. The dividend yield was okay, but again, nothing special in a healthcare context, so we sold out of Roche. China Vanke is one that we got wrong. So China Vanke is a Chinese real estate company. And we went into this one with our eyes open. It was a small position. Um, and we thought by going into one of the higher quality names in that sector, that by this time, there would have been a bit more of a solution in terms of Chinese property. And this would have been a company that was part of that solution and able to perhaps buy up weaker assets. But that has taken a lot longer and it's, it's still not resolved. So we sold out of that one. And the catalyst for that was when the company canceled its dividend. It's the one stock that we own that had canceled its dividend this year. And um, so we sold for that reason. TC Energy is a company which um, operates in Canada. It's a pipeline company. And the switch from that into another name, Enbridge, was just for a preference for that name. So we now have one company rather than two within that category. And Eperoc is a name that we sold for the right reasons. So this is a company, it's a Swedish company, spun off of Atlas Copco a few years ago now. Um, it produces mining equipment and it just performed extremely well to the extent that the valuation in our view was looking quite expensive and the dividend income from the stock was at the lower end of what we would deem acceptable for the trust. Um, so that was a four divestments, one new stock into the trust, which has generated quite a lot of interest, Mercedes-Benz, we bought in February of this year. Um, and again, we went into it knowing that this was probably not a stock that was going to work straight away. Um, the area of automobiles is notoriously difficult, um, but I think for this company, it has done the right thing. So sort of three or four years ago, um, it simplified its business, it spun off its trucks and its buses business. Um, it definitely went more high end. It has improved margins and improved cash flows on the back of these changes. Um, and we think that over time um, that will be rewarded. Um, it does have exposure to China, which is why it's been a, one of the reasons why it's been a bit weaker since we bought it. Um, but there's more to it than just China. This is a truly global company and the thing that really made us um, get over the line on this one was the strength of its balance sheet. It has a net cash balance sheet. It is on a 9% dividend yield. And that is absolutely rock solid in terms of if you look at its cash flows. So while you're waiting for the capital side to come good, um, you're being paid a very attractive income in the meantime. And the other trades there, the top ups and the top slices, we typically do take money out of stocks which have run up quite hard. Some of the tech names I mentioned previously and adding at the same time to some names which have been a bit weaker, things like Perno and Diageo, which we bought this time last year. Um, the next slides really just give a bit more information on that. I won't go over them because um, I've spoken about them, but Eperoc, um has been a good performer. So we sold out that one. 
Um, and then if we continue in the slides, please. Um, and again, thank you. Um, again, more information on Mercedes-Benz there, but really the next section is talking about um, the range of different companies that we can invest in for Murray International. We're very lucky, I think, to have the global remit and to have a barbell approach to that income story. So it's absolutely not the case that we need every single investment to have a yield of 4.5% because that's what we are seeking to pay out. Uh, we do have things like Broadcom, TSMC, BE Semiconductor, um, and that technology space that contribute to the income, but they're at the lower end of that range. And it's offset by other names, um, which are higher. Um, so things like we've got two tobacco companies, Philip Morris International, British American Tobacco, and um, some of our financial holdings pay very nice, healthy yields. OCBC is a good example of that, a Singaporean bank. And um, so you're, you're looking for a range of different companies at all times, which just means that, um, again, over time, you've got lots of different moving parts within the trust, which is ideal. And we put in for the first time this year on the next slide, um, a mix of where the income is being generated from. So again, it highlights the fact again that we don't need everything to work together at the same time. So the income is very well spread. So the top contributor last year was that Mexican airport operator, Grupo Asur, which again is a net cash business. It has a track record of really putting money away for a rainy day. It's coped with even before COVID, swine flu, hurricanes. And um, this is a business that knows how to be resilient. And part of that is putting cash aside and it pays very nice special dividends to its shareholders because of that. Um, and we do have, as you see, some of the most cyclical names in there, um, Valley, Total Energies, for example, which again, in, in good times, are very attractive from an income perspective. Um, and then on to the next section, please, just keeping an eye on my time here. Um, this is where you can see the spread of the investments, first of all, from a regional point of view and then from a sector point of view. And I think the trust today is as well diversified as it ever has been. So um, I've been involved in this trust for you know 20 years, actually. The names manager um, for the last five years or so um, and then taking over and um, stepping up in Bruce um, Stout, my colleague retired in June. Uh, but this chart is looking as good as it ever has. Um, so we have um, a really nice spread of different types of companies in there, both geographically and by sector. Um, and it doesn't like hugely change. If you're looking at this and then look at it six months down the line, it's not that we do that much trading that you would expect it to be transformed. But even five years ago, for example, the European equities exposure was half what it is today. Um, and the catalyst for that change, it's all stock driven, but it was um, really an interesting time when Russia first invaded Ukraine. And um, you were seeing a real revulsion as to people being interested in investing in certain parts of Europe. So that's when we were more active in that space. And the kind of companies we were interested in, they were global businesses, things like Danone in France and Siemens in Germany. Um, and at that point, we picked them up at really quite attractive valuations. So over time, because of the stock changes, obviously these overall percentages can change, um, but that spread of businesses is ideal. Um, and then on to the next section, please. This is just um, a bit of an outlook. It's always the hardest bit because really, and um, we don't have any great insights into this. People can wax lyrical about this section and really it's it can be a bit of a guessing game. And again, I think we are very fortunate in that we don't have to operate in just one area. So having the spread of different companies that we have, there's always a quality bias. We like the you know net cash balance sheets, we like strong management teams. So even if markets have a bit of a wobble, um, these types of companies tend to be fairly resilient and there is plenty of looking out still to be a bit concerned about certainly so the geopolitical risks um, just seem to be increasing all the time I think inflation is still a risk so as much as it's been coming down um, some of the policies that you're seeing in the US for example that may uh, be put to work if depending who gets in actually in the US election could be 
inflationary. Um, any sort of wars tend to be inflationary. Um, so there's still, I think, plenty that would make you kind of scratch your head when you look to see that several markets just now are trading at all time highs. An awful lot of focus has been on what the Fed hasn't done actually just very recently and that's been cutting interest rates uh, but there's been so much attention put on that um, and it seems to be that even bad news turns into good news at times so um, even after all these years I still quite can't get my head around some of that uh, but the, the beauty of our trust is that we focus on companies you know we're picking 50 companies to deliver the investment objective of the trust um, and we we really do make full use of the global remit in order to do that. And so I think that's me about out of time. I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Samantha. Thanks very much, Samantha, for a very interesting presentation there. Um, we do have some, some questions. If anyone uh, would like to ask any more questions, don't forget to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can enter your question there. So we'll, we'll make a start then. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, we have a question from Tom. Has the approach of the investment team changed in any way following the retirement of Bruce Stout? Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Everyone's watching us very closely um, since Bruce left. So for those of you who don't know, um, Bruce Stout was the manager, the lead manager of Murray International for 20 years. Um, he retired in June. Um, Martin and myself, who are now co-managers, um, we have been involved in the trust for myself, directly involved for five years, Martin for seven years. Um, so that transition um, has been very smooth. Um, so the investment process hasn't changed at all. Um, at Aberdeen, we rely on our analysts who are located all over the world. They're the ones visiting companies and coming back with recommendations of stocks that might work for Murray International. And then we do our analysis over and above that to decide what stocks we think are the strongest. Um, the beauty of the trust is that the investment objective isn't mine. It's not Martin's. It wasn't Bruce's. Um, in terms of what we're trying to achieve, that's a shareholder decision. And it's up to the board to make sure that we as managers um, are on the right track with that. So um, I, th I think we will be scrutinized and rightly so people will be making sure that we're we're sticking to what we should be um, as we are relatively new um, to being the lead managers, um, but nothing um, has changed in that regard. Thanks, Samantha. Um, I'll combine the next two questions as they're essentially uh, similar. So uh, what is the rationale for holding EM bonds and how is your position size likely to change in the future with the expected fall in interest rates? Yeah, um, so I haven't actually mentioned this. So we can and we do make use of fixed income, um, but very opportunistically. So over the past 20 years, there's only been two periods that we've had sizable positions in fixed income. Um, and the most recent one was 2014-15 um, when we bought these emerging market bonds. And at that time, um, it was because they were trading at really, really like screamingly cheap valuations um, compared to what we could achieve on the equities category. So some of the yields on these, you know, were kind of like 9%. They were trading at sort of 60 cents. I mean, it was just ridiculously cheap. So that's when we went into some of these names. Um, but we have since sold quite a few because um, during COVID actually they held up incredibly well. And um, so the kind of bonds that we were looking at were either um, corporate bonds where we thought the quality of the corporates was really good. So we had Valley bonds, for example, we had the equities anyway. So if you're kind of happy with the quality of the equities, you would be interested in the bonds since they would come first in any real time of difficulty. Um, and we do have some sovereign bonds as well, a mixture of local currency and dollar. Um, we only would ever go into bonds like this if they had already been scrutinised by our emerging markets bond team at Aberdeen. So it's never been the case that Bruce or Martin or myself would just go alone and pick these things. That's not our area of expertise. We need to have them, first of all, held by our, our experts really within the company. Um, but the weighting now is about 6%. As um, so I say, we sold some during COVID. We sold a Valley bond at 140, which was just ridiculous, really. We put that money into things like Broadcom and Abbey. 
at that time, which were offering much higher yields and better capital upside, obviously. So the direction of travel has been for it to come down. It probably will come down further because they're kind of in no man's land at the moment. They're not really cheap. They're not really expensive. The running yield on that part of the portfolio is about you know eight percent. So they're they're good from an income perspective, and um, but we're we're not adverse to selling some things if they do get really more on that expensive side. And we don't we don't have to have them. As I say, it just depends on what the opportunity set is. Thanks. Yes, that makes sense. So the next question is about your your investment process. Uh, you have a very large potential investment universe. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you filter that down to to the companies that you you want to buy? Or yeah, that's, that's your, that you want to buy. Right. So it's fantastic having choice, but given that there's thousands and thousands of opportunities out there, and um, we have to come up with about fifty. Um, the work initially is carried out by our analysts. So there are 110, I think it is at the moment, um, regional analysts, Aberdeen, and they spend the bulk of their time visiting companies and coming up with recommendations. And they know that one of the key objectives that they have to fulfill is finding stocks that are suitable for a variety of income products at Aberdeen. So it's no use to us whatsoever if we're just being... Um, fed lots of ideas with no income and um, they, they know that that's part of the, their job is, is to give us ideas that are going to work for these products so um, we do have a coverage list um, of around about um, I think it's about kind of 500 names but if you, you know screen for income and by income like again it's not that we need four and a half for every name but the minimum at the moment that we have is about one and a half percent from an income, um, so then a dividend yield perspective. So again, that gets rid of a lot. Um, and a lot of companies are pretty similar um, as well. So, you know, you may have OCBC, which we have a Singa Singaporean bank. We're not going to double up and have UOB and DBS because they're essentially the same kind of companies. So over the years, we've got to know that list really well. And we do screen for quality metrics, you know, things like... Um, you know, dividend growth over time, we, we like to see that strength in the balance sheet. So we'll screen out companies on that basis as well. And now, as it stands, any new company has really got to be a, a strong contender um, to bump out something that we already own or to provide something different. So it's never been the case that we've started off with a blank sheet of paper and then had to find, you know, 50 names out of that coverage list that we think are going to work. Um, in reality, it's an analyst coming with a potential new income idea. Uh, we will discuss it with them. We also have discussions with other income managers at Aberdeen because mm -hmm. it just makes a lot more sense to kind of pull our power in terms of discussing ideas. It's up to Martin and myself what makes it into Murray International. But I'm very interested to hear, you know, what Charlie Luke, who manages Murray Income, thinks of Mercedes because he also owns it as well. He owned it before we did, for example. So these kind of discussions happen all the time. And that's where, again, part of the selection process comes from, is, is having these discussions and trying to identify companies that we think are better than what we've got or a bit different than what we've got, and sort of using, it's a filtering process, essentially, um, and getting to the names that actually are good enough to make it in, in our view. Thanks. Um, if I can just uh, ask a supplement to, to that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the coverage universe of your analysts was 500 companies, if that's yep. that great. That, that's still a, a very small proportion mm -hmm. of the companies out there. How, how was that 500 selected? Um, so again, we've become, I think, a lot more um, efficient in this regard. At, at one mm -hmm. time, when Aberdeen and Standard Life merged together seven years mm -hmm. ago now, that mm -hmm. coverage list would have been like in the thousands, not the hundreds. Mm -hmm. And that it meant there was an awful lot of work being done and coverage in company meetings that were never finding their way into a portfolio. Um, so as Aberdeen has become, are trying to become more efficient over time um, and really focus on, well, what, what kind of companies are we looking for? You can kind of put them in three buckets now. It's income, it's like funds with a sustainable angle, and mm -hmm. we have small cap and mid cap products as well, predominantly these three categories. So it's meant that the coverage list has shrunk with an idea more in the back of the analyst's mind, first and foremost, like are these ever really going to make it into a portfolio? So um, 
It's not that they wouldn't be aware of other companies. Of course they are. You know, if you're looking at TSMC, um, Jamie, who covers that as our analyst, is going to be having discussions and meetings with lots of other companies um, who are peers, who are customers, who are providers to that business. But if I talk about something under coverage, it means there is an, an obligation on that analyst to, to write quite a detailed note, to provide detailed feedback on earnings. So that level of coverage is quite a high bar. You have to commit to that as an analyst. So and that's that's the kind of balance. It's like ideally you'd love eyes on everything, but we don't have um, infinitely many people and you want to be awesome. to use them well and to, to make sure that they feel their work's been valued as well because you don't want people visiting companies and coming up with what might, might be a, a good investment, but it's just not got a natural home in any of the, the products that we manage. And that would be very disheartening, I think. So um, mm -hmm. I think between the, the PMs and the analysts, there's a lot more debate as well quite early on as to what kind of companies are going to work. Um, so that's right. how it's evolved over time. So, so there's an initial filtering process that the analysts do in exactly. conjunction with the portfolio <laughs> managers to decide what they're going to cover. Before an analyst, like I had a conversation recently with one of our um, consumer discretionary analysts um, and, and she had, had pitched an idea, but just as an initial idea. So before I go and do all this work, is it something that potentially is of interest and we have a conversation and that can be a yes or a no. Um, and it helps her to manage her time better as well, rather than going off and doing a lot of work that's really a bit going to waste. So that's yeah. how yeah, we that's, do that's, in, that's important. I mean, mm. Doing a thorough analysis is a time-consuming process. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, okay, then Adrian is asking, could you say a little about equity? Yeah. Ah, well, in fact, I think that it's really a repeat of what we've just oh. discussed. So uh, I'll... Uh, Mark that one as uh, as dealt with. Okay, um, Adrian also um, questions. It says the position size limit of five percent seems a bit low. Mm -hmm. Have you done any analysis of quotes lost profits mm -hmm. as a result of routinely selling successful investments? Mm -hmm. you know, there is, is the old run your winners. Um, yeah, I think that is a good one, and it, we we do look at these things. So looking at um analysis of our trading because some of these tech stops have just like continued to do well so there, there is lost performance if you want to look at it that way from continually trimming Broadcom continually trimming TSMC uh, for example with these two positions they're currently four and a half percent but just this year we've taken two and a half percent out of Broadcom we've taken one and a half out of TSMC so these could potentially you know be a lot bigger but we are willing to give up that perform lost performance, if you like, mm -hmm. rather than become besotted by a stock and become really concentrated. So especially when you have stocks in the same sector, a similar um, area, all doing really well, they're all going to come out off at the same time as well, probably. So that can still be painful, but it's going to be a lot less painful if they're 5% each rather than 15% each. So... Um, I, I don't think there's a there's a perfect answer to this. Like, yeah, you, you could have run them up harder. You could have got more or out of these. But actually, at what point do you just get greedy and then you're kind of setting yourself up for a big fall at some point in time? And again, that's not, I think, what people expect in this product. Um, you know, have, having that spread of different exposures is something that we actively seek rather than really kind of putting your eggs all in the one basket and becoming... Um, really beholden to a couple of stocks continuing to do well. We quite like having that diversity, like having that spread, if, even if it means that you could have got a few more percentage points when, when times are good. Thanks, Samantha. Yeah, that, that's mm. similar to my own investment process. Mm. I, I value being able to sleep at night, not having a massive percentage in a small number of holdings. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Adrian also asks, um, can AI help on stock picking? Is it something you you use or, or, your, or your, your firm has looked at at all? Yeah, not for stock picking. We, I'm always quite at the tail end with these things. I'm not particularly smart on techie stuff, okay. but even I have started to, to dabble. And it's more for writing. So um, I like summarising meeting notes. So it's not for stock picking yet. I mean, maybe it will be at some point or be investigated that way to my knowledge it hasn't been uh, for Aberdeen but Mike it does save you a lot of time just you know doing things like reading, writing up minutes and 
um, you know, even just um, trying to condense a lot of information. Um, so that's that has been useful, but it's more making you work more efficiently rather than trying to replicate what you're doing on the stock picking side. Great. Uh, then Ray asks, what, what is your portfolio turnover and active mm -hmm. share? I'm not sure what uh, what index you benchmark. Yes, yeah, so actually I have an official benchmark. We have a reference index, which um, is the okay. FTSE All World. Um, mm -hmm. And against that, the active share has consistently been about like mid nineties, like for for ages. So it's it's very very different from from anything else really out there, including the index. Um, sorry, what was the first part of the question? That was active share. Um, portfolio turnover. And over again. So this this can change just depending on opportunities. So, um, last year it was seven percent, um, of assets was the turnover. Mm -hmm. So fairly low, um. Mm -hmm. What you will see is when there's real a real shake up in the market, like we were actually pretty active in COVID times. Um, mm -hmm. but the market, if you remember, like really fell and then really bounced back again. There was a six week mm -hmm. window um, mm -hmm. in sort of um, March, April time, 2020. And we introduced quite a number of stocks then, maybe like three, four new names then. Mm -hmm. um, so it does vary just depending on what markets are doing. And this year, um, just in the first half of the year, uh, it was 8% the turnover, which again, for a half year period, is fairly high for us. But half of the sales that we did was this forced selling in a way, top slicing all of those stocks that had bumped against the 5% maximum. Um, so obviously, like there's, there's not one figure, but that kind of number, um, you know, between a kind of 7% and a 15%, for example, would be uh, the range that we would think is fairly normal. Okay. Uh, okay. The next question is actually the the same. Uh, so we'll get rid of that one as well. Asking, I mean, relating it to the magnificent seven, but mm. it's asking about active share. Yeah. Um, okay. Then Gerald is asking about forex. Now I understand from your presentation yeah. that you don't hedge currencies and you just take the, mm. the currency risk. Is is that correct? We don't hedge. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, the we, answer is you don't manage we, forex. We do think about it from time to time because, on the face of it, you know, there is five percent in the UK, ninety-five percent in other currencies. But mm -hmm. we have, I think, it was like twenty-two different currencies we're invested in. And um, if you were trying to do that, so and even the timing of the dividends, it's not like you get them all at the same mm -hmm. time. So then you can set up a hedge on that day. Um, the the deal really do pay throughout the year. Um, and the cost of doing that, the complexity of doing that um, has just meant that we've not gone there ever. Um, and if you look at it over a long period of time, over 20 years, um, and any attribution report, the contribution from currency is negligible. So you might feel at times like, oh, this is really painful, or on the opposite side, you can get a real boost from currencies. It really comes out in the wash if, if you look mm -hmm. at it over a, a decent period of time. Um, so no, we've, we've never hedged the currency side. Thanks, Samantha. Okay, um, just remind people there, there are no no other open questions from delegates. There's there's one that that I, that I might ask uh, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Of course. Uh, but if anyone else would like to ask any more, do continue to type them into the Q and A box. Um, I noted that your your dividend policy, the fact that you you can only, you only pay dividends out of income, mm -hmm. means that you are constrained to invest in not not totally, but to a certain extent in in higher yielding equities. Mm. Um, wouldn't you have more flexibility to invest in in quality growth companies mm. if your dividend could be paid out of capital as well? So you can yeah, again, it's it's something that the board have discussed from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it has become more popular as, as markets have been generally on the upward trend over these last few yeah. years. But the difficulty does come um, when, when markets aren't. When things go the other way, yes. And I think having this very clear message is important to people so they know what they're getting with Money International. They know um, about that covered dividend objective. Um, and as it stands just now, um, you know, we, we can have one and one and a half percent yielders. So actually, if you're looking at the range of companies you can have as for mm -hmm. that as a minimum, um, mm -hmm. we've never been in the situation that we, we haven't been able to get 
diversification or we haven't been able to get companies that even like an AI, the kind of areas mm -hmm. of the market that you think are going to deliver on the capital side. Um, there's always been a way to play that, um, mm -hmm. but with the objective of um, every single company that we invest in contributing to the income up to a point. Um, and it does change. It's really interesting. So Broadcom, one of the stocks we own in tech that's just like a low yielder just now, one and a half percent. When we bought this, that was one of the names we bought during the height of COVID. And when we bought it then, that was a 7% dividend yielding stock. Um, so it, it fluctuates hugely. So I think um, that's why we do keep an, an open mind. You know, it's not to say that a 1% yielder now is always going to be a 1% yielder. Mm -hmm. um, so the dividend growth is really important as well. So as much as we we'll mm -hmm. look at what the yield is, but having that willingness and ability and commitment to growing a dividend is important for us as well. But I think mm -hmm. um, kind of looking at it and finding companies that way and basing how we run Murray International in that regard, it just makes people hopefully kind of sure about what they're buying into. Um, and then there's plenty of other options for them if, you know, they want to go down the route of paying um, income out of capital. Mm -hmm. So we don't feel constrained, I guess, is the conclusion by doing things this way. Okay, yeah, and I, I suppose it it mm -hmm. increases the chances that you'll be able to maintain and grow your own yeah. dividend. I think, again, say, that's because... so valuable for our shareholders. So, so now, nowadays, a 4.5% yield... Um, you know, you can get that from a variety of different yeah. products now, but that has not always been the case. I don't think it will always be the case going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so showing that chart at the very beginning where we've, we've managed to do that over lots and lots of different types of market environments over time, and um, because this is how we do it, um, gives people that confidence, I suppose, that they might not otherwise have. Right. OK, well, that's been very interesting, Samantha. Thanks very much for, for the presentation, answering all the questions and, and, for, and for your time. It's My really pleasure. appreciated. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye for now.